Hi, uh, my name is Colin, and I am going to be presenting the paper Level Assembly as a Markup Decision Process. And I did this work with my advisor, Seth Cooper. So um, just as a starter, this is a basic level progression. It's static, meaning it's unchanging. So the player will start at level one and then eventually hopefully get it to level 14. And um, with these kinds of static level progressions, there's a lot of advantages for the designer. But one of the problems with them is that they are not one size fits all. So you may have certain problem levels, such as in this case, let's say it's level 11. And um, at these levels, there's gonna be the problem where the player runs into them. And if they haven't learned what they needed to learn before, the player is going to struggle and then eventually quit. And you're gonna have unfinished levels for that player, which is kind of unideal. And it can leave the player with a sour taste in their mouth. And you may get some, I guess, unwarranted reviews and how mean they can be. So I wanna look at how we can kind of try to address this. And one of the answers is dynamic progressions. And when we're talking about dynamic progressions, one of the common problems is, well, how do I select the next level? If there's a mechanic in level 11 that the player hasn't figured out, which level should I select? And that's a difficult problem to answer. So a lot of work has kind of tried to skirt around that and said, let's use procedural content generation. And with that, what we'll do is we'll take these levels, we'll feed them into some kind of PCG system, and then we'll have a level generator. And then we'll need some kind of way to evaluate levels. And that way of evaluation will then assess the player's skill. And then you'll have this kind of generate and test methodology. And um, Polymorph from Jillian Smith and colleagues is a good example of this kind of approach. And it can work really well, but there are problems. Specifically, you're asking the designers to create a lot of additional content, which is kind of like the fundamental tension of procedural content generation in games. And the other problem is the actual creating the player model to assess player skill. And this is always going to be problematic just because you're asking the developers to do a lot of work when they may be better off just trying to get a static regression to work for as many players as possible. So what I want to talk about is a kind of different approach. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use a level corpus. And in our case, we're actually going to use a level segment corpus or level slice corpus where the director is going to take little things from this level corpus, assemble a level, and give it to the player and learn from the player. So it's similar, but slightly different. And um, now I wanna talk about this in a more kind of granular detail. And so the way our system is assembled is it works with the Markov decision process. So we start by initializing the Markov decision process, and then we build a policy with that MDP. Then with that policy, we build a level then we give that level to the player to play. And at this point, the player can either quit after they've played or they can choose to play again. And then we update the Markov decision process. And then you just get this cycle that goes and on and on until the player quits or ideally they beat the game. So now let's look at this in even more granular detail, starting with the Markov decision process. Just as background, a Markov decision process is made up of states, actions, rewards, and a transition table. As for our specific implementation, we actually use a kind of graph-like structure. So in this case, you have this S, which is the original state. S prime is the target state in the graph. And S double prime is the state that you can actually transition to. A state in our case is a level slice or a level segment. So in this case, S sub A is connected to S sub B. And imagine the player has beaten S sub A and is now playing S sub B. What happens though is they're not actually guaranteed to beat S sub B. So we don't consider them technically in the S sub B state because if they lose, what they would actually go into is the death state. And there's one actual other, other state we have and that's the start state. And we'll talk about that a little bit later once we get to the generating a level state. So as a few more details in terms of our transition table, we start out optimistic where all states and their neighbors are initialized to a probability of 99% chance of the player actually beating the target state. And there's a 1% chance that the player will lose in the target state and then enter the death state. In terms of rewards, we say for all states, the rewards are initialized to R sub D of S. R sub D is what we call the designer reward table. And uh, this is basically just saying, what does the designer value? In this case, we're saying it's um, a kind of a a surrogate for difficulty, but this does create this kind of bias. So the Markov decision process is heavily biased towards what the designer wants, 
But when we get to the update MDP step, we'll show how we slowly turn it into a mix of the player and the um, designer. And then the reward for the death state is negative one, but you could make it harsher if you'd like. That just goes into reward design, which is a whole topic in itself. Now we get to the policy. A policy pi takes in a state and it selects the next state given that state. We'll talk about how a policy is actually built when we talk about directors, but for now, let's just assume we've built a policy. So we'll go on to generating a level. So when we generate a level, let's just take an example and say we want to build a level that's three states long. So we enter start into the policy and we just get S sub A, for example, then S sub B, and then S sub C. So then we actually take the whole level, which is the concatenation of S sub A, S sub B, and S sub C, and we give it to the player to then play the level. Let's just say, for example, the player beats S sub A and fails 50% of the way through S sub B. So at this point, the player has a choice. They can choose to exit or they can choose to play again. In our case, let's just assume they decided not to quit and we're gonna go into updating the Markov decision process. So in this step, we have three different things we have to do. First, we have to update the neighbors for the start node. Then we need to update the rewards table. And then finally, we need to update the transition table. Looking at those one at a time, we'll start with neighbors. So the states that the player beat are added to neighbors to the start state. So in our example, we already know that S sub A is a neighbor, so it isn't added. And then for S sub B, S sub B was not beaten by the player and is not added. But for example, if S sub B was beaten and it was not a neighbor, then it would be added as a neighbor to the start state. And so this is how the player can start to explore more deeply into the Markov decision process. For the rewards, we have this little equation right here, where on the numerator, we have the designer reward table plus M of S. And this could be a player model. This could be the percent that they completed a level segment. In our case, we use kind of like a surrogate player model just to show how it could be accomplished, but percent complete would work as well. And then on the numerator, we have this N of S, which is just the number of times a state was, was seen by the player. So S sub A and S sub B would have been incremented in our example, but not S sub C because the player never actually made it to it. And then finally, in terms of the transitions, this is a little bit more complicated looking, but basically for every edge that has the target state of S prime, in this example, it's S sub A or S sub B, we basically update the wins and the visits, and then the probability is based on the number of times they've won divided by the number of times they've visited it. And then once we update this, we'll also update the death state for, P, for S sub A and S sub B. Now this is the whole system again, just as a reminder, we initialize the MVP, we build the policy, generate a level, the player can play, they can exit or up, choose to play again, and then we'll update the MVP if they choose to play again. Now we're gonna go more into this build a policy step and look into directors. So when we're using directors, we have two baseline directors that we test with to build a policy. The first is the random director and it builds a policy by randomly selecting any neighbor in the graph. The second is the greedy director and this builds a policy by selecting the neighbor with the largest reward as specifically just R of S not the designer reward just for clarity. And so now we'll look at into the next thing, which is the policy iteration director or just PI. Policy iteration is an adaptive dynamic programming technique, which approximates the utility of the state given a Bellman equation or the Bellman equation, sorry. And um, it works by running policy evaluation, which is the formula right below right here and policy improvement, which um, basically checks to see after this formula has been run, K times, has there been changes to uh, what was originally a random policy that is being updated with each iteration? If you want more details on policy iteration, I'd recommend looking at the paper, but um, this will just run and it will find a uh, theoretically optimal policy given our problem and to create the best possible level. So when we ran this, we found there were a few problems. So we decided to create adaptive policy iteration and adaptive policy iteration is gonna run the same exact thing as policy iteration with policy evaluation and improvement, but we do one extra step. And in this is where we keep a running tally of the player's losing streak. 
And so for each loss, what we do is we remove a neighbor from the start node, which has the highest designer reward. And we, um, we did this to prevent continuous player failure, which we found was a problem with just running policy iteration. And for those who are curious, edges can be re-added during play. We aren't keeping track of which edges are added. So if the player goes back and eventually beats it, then that edge is now technically allowed to be there again. So now we'll look at the evaluation. And to evaluate, we did two case studies. And I'm going to go a little bit quick so we have some time. Um, for Mario, we did n-grams. So s is a single column or level slice. We use levels from the DGLC to create a trigram. And that trigram is turned into an NDP. We use Somerville to test the play, Somerville's A star agent to test the playability of levels. Um, the designer reward table is initialized based on if there's an enemy or not to the level slice. The M of S is just the level slice density, which is the number of solid tiles divided by the total number of tiles in the column. And then we ran 20 times, generating 50 levels each time. In terms of our reward, this is the mean reward and this is the standard deviation. API and PI performed exactly the same, but Greedy had a higher percent complete and random was second highest. API was higher than PI, which wasn't surprising. But this actually shows one of the problems with this approach where if we can't guarantee playability, then this method really isn't that great because if you're not even guaranteeing playability, then any level that the player knows they cannot beat no matter what they do is just gonna be a frustrating experience. So in terms of some of the levels, you can see Right here, this is the first level generated, very enemy heavy. And in the last level, you can see that Greedy hasn't changed that much, whereas Policy and API have. And, but you can also see one problem where when you're generating levels with a lot of level slices, you have looping that can occur when you're using an n-gram structure for your MDP. Moving on to our second case study, we used Icarus. So in this case, we're saying that S is a level segment and we used I believe it was 20 level slices for each level segment. Um, for our level segment corpus, we used our previous work, Gramlites. And Gramlites is just an extension to Maplites. And we take advantage of the grid that you see with Maplites for this. The behavioral characteristics are linearity and leniency. R sub, R sub D is the mean of each segment's behavioral characteristics. The graph formed is, is by using the Maplites grid. And then we use our past work where we linked these where we linked neighbors in the Maplates grid. So that's the graph that we then turned into our markup decision process. We use player proxies instead of running an agent. And we could do that because our previous work proved that when you're actually connecting these level segments, you're guaranteed completability when running Icarus at the very least. And then finally, we did the same amount of runs and levels generated. For our player proxies, we had six good players, but mediocre players and bad players. We had a always win threshold based on the behavioral characteristics. And that's because we're kind of using these as a proxy for difficulty that isn't necessarily perfect. And the rewards are based on the sum of the behavioral characteristics divided by the maximum behavioral characteristics. And then the reverse if the player like easy levels. And then this is just density and leniency. In terms of our results, you can see in this table that API had the highest reward across all the players. And um, policy iteration also did fairly well, but not for all examples. For example, in this one, good player likes easy levels. You can see policy iteration was actually the worst performing um, director of the four. In terms of percent complete, you can see that random is always highest. And that's because it was um, just not going towards harder levels. So it was the players could mostly finish it. And then also you can see that API generally may not necessarily have the highest um, percent complete that you would expect. And this actually isn't problematic to us because in our opinion, these kinds of games should be challenging the players. So it's not necessarily problematic that they die. It's only problematic if they can never actually beat the level and make progress. So this seems to find the right balance. Looking at the a heat map of states visited, we can see that for example, PI is gonna follow the, the frontier of, like, of what the bad player can play through, whereas API is gonna kind of move backwards as it tries to find levels that can be played. So it ends up having more repeated states, but it also is able to get the player to learn more or theoretically learn more. And you see this again with good player likes easy levels. This just kind of shows one of the weaknesses with this approach, which is that even though the player likes easy levels, which would be over here, it's actually still going all the way out here and the same for policy iteration. So just because we said, this is what the designer likes, 
it kind of just goes straight in that direction, even if the player may like an easy level more. So there is still some work there. These are some of the levels generated. We wanted very dense levels with a lot of enemies. So this is why you see a lot more density over here, whereas greedy and random didn't really pull that off as much. And then our last case study we did was switching player proxies. And in this case, we had a, for 35 levels, the good player likes hard levels plays, good le player likes hard levels proxy play. And that's because it's kind of the ideal case for the MDP where the designer board and the player are kind of working together. And then at level 35, we switched from bad player proxy to bad player likes bad player likes easy levels. And that's because that player proxy is the opposite of what we would want. And API is the yellow line here. And you can see initially it struggles for both, for both the reward and the percent complete, but then it quickly adjusts after about seven levels, whereas policy iteration showed no signs of adaptation, same with greedy and random just never adapted. So that why it just, that's why it just goes up because it was like in this example, it just stayed towards the origin every single time. So in terms of conclusion, segment generation is the ideal use case for this approach to level assembly and not something like level slices. Um, behavioral characteristics are probably not the best metric for rewarding difficulty, but as I discussed in the paper, there are other, there is work that has looked into this and this work could benefit from that. Um, in terms of future work, we want to change it to be a multi-objective MDP with a finite horizon. Finite horizon, because the levels were generated are finite horizon. We're not trying to generate a many levels with this one policy. We want to generate just one level. And then finally, we want to run this, run a study with human participants where we take what we've learned from this study, improve it, and then try it with humans to see if this method could actually be a, a, a valid way to, to go about dynamic difficulty investment. So um, with that, these are our work cited. And um, thank you. Oh yeah, and this is a link to the repo for anybody who's curious. And I believe it's public and ready to go.